Good afternoon, um, everybody. And in the uh, spirit of the frontier, I'm not going to talk about all the sorts of things my lab normally does. I'm going to give you a new and unexpected uh, story that came up as a side project. The time of your life, you will probably all remember the time of your life and that you will be different at different ages. And yes, those were the days. And these bright young things here were clearly doing something very special at the time. And no doubt, they will have fond memories of their creativity and their intelligence and inspiration at the time. But the reason they might remember what they did back then may be in part due to the reminiscence bump, which refers to the disproportionate number of autobiographical memories that one tends to have over the age of 40. And if you ask people what it is that they might remember, they'll typically remember things in their 20s. And wasn't that a good time that we had? Now, the 20s are also a very interesting time because it is when it is recognized that one's ability to solve problems, fluid intelligence, is at its peak, at its greatest. And one can do all of those clever things, such as design software and other things. But it's also uh, been documented that that is also when we are at our most creative in our mid-20s. And these, this great period of time that I'm referring to here tends to sort of peter out around about the 30s, and then you sort of hit middle age, and it's a little bit downhill and boring after that. But it's also a time in your 20s when lots of other rather bad stuff can happen. And it is well known that the great majority of mental disorders have an onset in adolescents and young adults. And it's quite mysterious as to why that really is the case. People tend to think it's because of the things that happen to you, the people you meet, the drugs you take, the places you go, that boyfriend or girlfriend who doesn't seem to work out. But a disease which I think is really a sort of archetypal young adult onset disorder, of course, is schizophrenia, which typically begins in the mid-20s with its first episode, florid psychosis. So however you look at this, the 20s are, from a psychological standpoint, a time of great interest um, and importance as far as the nervous system is concerned. But why? And what is going on there? And I'd like to just put forward a few questions that we might just touch on uh, today. The first is to ask, what kind of biological mechanism could explain these mental phenomena in the young adult? And do those different phenomena, and, the, and indeed others that happen in people in their 20s, have anything in common? And why are the 20s so important? Now, there must be some genetic component, because learning, intelligence, schizophrenia, and other mental disorders have strong heritability and or known genetic mechanisms. But why, if it is genetic, would a genetic influence not show up at birth and only manifest in young adults? Why is it sort of silent and only come on if that is the case? And moreover, once it has become a, in the 20s, a disorder comes on in the 20s, if there is a genetic mechanism to it, then why does it sort of later decline in middle age? Now, I'm going to tell you about a project which, as I've already mentioned, was a side project done by a PhD student, Nathan Skeen. Now, this work has been uh, recently published uh, in eLife. And in our laboratory, we do a lot of mouse genetics, and we happen to have a large number of mice of a wide range of ages just sitting around, and we were wondering what to do with them. And we thought that we would study their gene expression um, in the brain, and because we had them over a wide period of ages, we could sample across many different ages. And therefore, for every individual gene, we could measure the expression across the lifespan as a trajectory. Now, this is quite an interesting thing to do because you can then look at these trajectories and say, when do the gene trajectories turn? 
And turning points are interesting because they mark the age when gene regulation happens. And of course, we use these sorts of approaches routinely when looking at something like cell cycle or maze development or something. Now, having that sort of sampling is much more and preferable to the rather commonly used approach for looking at age-related changes, which is to take some young versus old. But when you do that, you don't get the trajectory and turning points. OK, so um, if you were to uh, think about this in a very simple-minded way and say, I have now trajectories of gene expression, you could catalog them into simple ones, which simply just go up or down or stay the same, into, and those that are complex, which go up and turn. And it's these turning points that we're interested in. It'll go up and turn and go to a plateau or reverse or come down and go to a plateau or reverse. And you could simply uh, identify those different types. And the key thing is to find the turning points. And this is what we did. So we had, at first, a lot of mice. We took out the hippocampus, looked at gene expression, genome-wide, across all genes, and then I plotted the uh, trajectories for age and turning points across the lifespan. And with this complicated set of patterns of gene expression, we asked, were there any patterns within them using machine learning approaches? And we decided that we would use that information to ask the question, can we predict the age of a mouse if it were that we just took an individual RNA sample from some mouse, and using those patterns that we have now identified, can we predict how old the animal is? And we did that, and this is what we found. This is, I think, a rather astonishing graph, because what it says is that, of course, one can predict the age pretty accurately of the mouse from any RNA sample. These are individual mouse samples here. And moreover, it says that at every age, the mouse is different. So as it goes through life, its gene expression pattern is changing such that at every age, it's highly characteristic. We thought, that's pretty interesting. What happens if we look in humans? And we obtained the brain cloud data set, human prefrontal cortex, 269 samples from embryonic stages through to 78 years of age. And we did the same thing. And that's what we found in humans. And as you can see here, there's a very nice graph as well, which says the same as what it says in the mouse, namely that at every age, the human is different. And the brain is different and changes throughout life. So at every age, in both mouse and human, there's a characteristic pattern of gene expression that makes you the person you are at every single age. So this is the way we see it, that at every age, your brain gene expression is different. As you're going through life, it's like turning the pages in a book, and there's a kind of a genetic biography across the lifespan. And it is marked by a calendar of genetic regulatory events that occur at all sorts of different ages. So we thought this genetic calendar, as we call it, across the lifespan, would be pretty interesting to understand. And we thought the first question we would ask is, are those calendars the same in a mouse as they are in a human? Because after all, a mouse lives for about two years, and a human's living for about 80 years. So they have a very great difference in their overall lifespan. And so how might we be able to compare them? Well, one way to do that is to ask, are there any conserved landmarks of gene regulatory events? And the first thing we thought we'd ask was, when do most genes turn? When do those turning points happen? And we'll talk about it in the context of humans, since that is, after all, what we are. And most of us will be able to reflect upon their own life and ask when they might have thought those sorts of things did happen. If I ask that to an audience, they will typically say puberty. And needless to say, they might suggest to you that males um, would uh, change a little bit later than females. But neither of those things are true. Here is the peak. This is the turns. And as you can see, there's a very obvious peak here. And if in males, it is at 26 years of age. And in females, it is delayed by about two years, 27.5 years. And it's highly statistically significant. 
So there's something very special about the changes that are going on in the mid-20s. There are this sort of maelstrom of genetic changes in gene expression that are going on at that age. Does the same thing happen in mice? It does, and it occurs at about five months of age, and again, the female is delayed compared to the male. Highly statistically significant. So we thought that this peak, or transcriptome trajectory turning point peak, would be worthy of investigation to find out what is really sort of going on at that age. This just shows you in a cumulative sum of those scores across the lifespan, the dramatic nature of those changes in the 20s. And you can see they're happening here, and they tend to run out by about the age of 40. So I'm going to just say a little bit more about those changes and define the trajectories that I've told you about. You will recall I talked about trajectories that plateau. And these gene expression profiles are turning and they're plateauing so that the great majority of them are all over and done with by the time you hit 40. So the vast majority of genes have plateaued by 40 years of age. Let me try to illustrate what that means here. This is the lifespan. And in gray, I'm showing you this trajectory turning point peak period. And these are just several different genes here. And I've drawn the tra uh, trajectories for you so that, as you can see, at birth, they come down. And at the red point, they turn. And then they reach these sort of plateau stage. So you see the genes have now stabilized after the turning points that have occurred at some stage during that. But let's consider. Um, this plateau just a little bit more and think about what it actually means. It means that the level of a gene's expression reaches a stable set point by that age. And so if an inappropriate set point in that plateau phase uh, occurs, then that could result in a lifelong phenotype if the gene expression went too low or perhaps too high. And I'll just illustrate that for you here with these simple cartoons, where again, we're looking at the level of gene expression across the lifespan. And here is just the, the normal gene expression, we'll call it. And there's the turning point, and there's the normal plateau. But if it were that the uh, trajectory was such that it was too steep, and it turned at the same time, it still could, e it could end up so that the gene expression profile was too low. Another sort of variant of that might be that if the gene expression was activated, and it turned too late, it would end up being too low. So it could be a very critical thing to have the gene expression being controlled in that phase of your life, because it could affect the rest of your life uh, through that plateau. So what we're then looking at here, and I've just simply aligned the peak age of transcription turning points are superimposed on these very interesting aspects of cognitive biology that occur in people in their 20s. Is there any kind of connection between the two of these things? Well, one way to look at this is simply to ask, what are the genes that are changing? Well, of course, we know all of the genes. And we can look for the types of proteins that are expressed. And we can ask, are they involved with any particular behavior or disease. And when you do that, you find that those genes that are in this peak are highly enriched in synapse proteins. We were delighted to see this because these are proteins that we've been studying for the last 25 years. And in the postsynaptic proteome of excitatory synapses, and you've seen various cartoons of these in various talks today, there are many different proteins. In fact, there's over 1,000 highly conserved, species-conserved proteins in mouse and human in the postsynaptic proteome. And those proteins are enriched in the transcription turning points in mid-20s, as indeed are other proteins, which are parts of what's called the PSD95 supercomplexes. And those proteins are also enriched there. And this is a rather nice plot here, which Nathan uh, has developed, whereby you can take a list of genes and ask, at what age does that list of genes turn? And if you look beneath the red line, you'll see here 
that these are the ages when the postsynaptic density genes are being uh, regulated and changed in the mid-20s. Just to tell you a bit more about what those proteins are, here is a, a, a cartoon schematic of an excitatory, excitatory glutamatergic synapse. On the postsynaptic side, there's neurotransmitter receptors, and many of which are assembled into these supercomplexes. I'd just like to explain to you how the postsynaptic proteome is assembled. It's a hierarchical protein assembly where the individual proteins are all assembled into into complexes. Uh, of course, you'll be very familiar with ion channel complexes and perhaps other kinds of signal transduction complexes. But many of these, in turn, are organized into something called supercomplexes, which are very high molecular weight structures of which the PSD95 supercomplexes um, are involved. Now, it is these sets of proteins here that are being regulated and changed at this point in your mid-20s. In other words, there must be some major molecular rearrangement going on in the excitatory synapses um, of the human nervous system during the 20s. Now, I'm just going to summarize in two slides. Um, uh, there is really a very large literature on the importance of those proteins and those complexes that are changing in their mid-20s. And proteins that are in these PSD95 supercomplexes this extensive literature is on, from mouse and human genetics shows they're crucial for all sorts of aspects of cognition. And I've just listed a few papers uh, from our own laboratory here where we've been shown that these proteins involve simple and complex forms of learning and memory. And in collaboration with Ian Deary's group, Ian's uh, group has shown that the proteins within these complexes are indeed um, significantly associated with uh, fluid intelligence. And there are many other uh, papers as well that show the importance of these molecules. So it goes without saying that these are important molecules for aspects of cognition, and they are being, and their levels of expression are important, and they are being adjusted um, at this critical time in the young adult brain. Now, there's also very substantial literature of the importance of these proteins uh, in diseases. Over 50 different brain disorders have been linked to various sorts of mutations, CNVs, and all sorts of other variants in those, and as you can see here, there's various cognitive disorders uh, listed that are, are known to be dependent on the appropriate levels of expression of these. But I'm going to focus on uh, schizophrenia, and here's just a list of papers um, that have, uh, we've been involved with, which is showing that there's an enrichment of schizophrenia genetic variants in the proteins that are in these PSD95 supercomplexes. Now, the reason I'm going to focus on those is because of the most fascinating aspect of schizophrenia, in my view, is not so much as the cognitive impairments, but it is why does it come on in young adults? And the way we approached this question was to ask, are these schizophrenia genes coordinately regulated in such a way that they might coincide with the period of time when the disease typically starts? And essentially, the strategy is to uh, take lists of schizophrenia susceptibility genes, and then using the algorithms that we've used to define the lifespan genetic calendar, plot the age windows when they are changing. And this is what we see. And these plots here, uh, again, if you look beneath the red line, this is a set of schizophrenia genes, and you'll see that it is coinciding directly with the classic age of onset of schizophrenia, and also when you separate it into the difference between male and female. And it is well known in schizophrenia that females have a delayed onset over males, and you can see that males precede females. So both the known age window and sex bias of schizophrenia is predicted from this genetic lifespan calendar model. If you want to read about all the various biological replications, all of the different sorts of genetic data sets, then please go to the uh, eLife paper where you can uh, look at all of that. But these results were robust across all sorts of different uh, data sets of many different kinds. So here are five hallmarks of schizophrenia that need to be explained in any model, whichever one uh, you may wish to uh, support. And the first is that it is the age of onset and the progression of the disorder and it's typical that they have an uneventful childhood and adolescence, then a prodromal cognitive symptoms, and in their mid-20s, they get the florid psychosis in young adults. And then, by about the age of 40, the disorder goes into a sort of a burnout phase, and there's a sort of a decay of aspects of uh, cognition, 
leaving them with residual lifelong symptoms. And incidentally, it's also known that the age of onset is heritable. Not that the disease itself is heritable, which it is, but it's also the age of onset, which also fits with the notion of this genetic lifespan calendar being important. A second characteristic I've already mentioned is that females have a later onset, about two years, uh, than males. And thirdly, the genetic susceptibility, we've heard about some of that this morning, where it is known that there is a large number of genes, and there's a diverse set of genes, and indeed many of those disease genes are those proteins that are found in synapses, which are those proteins that are being altered and adjusted at that critical age of onset of the disorder. And another aspect of the disorder is that the cell biology, one has to ask how do all of those different genes converge in a common cellular mechanism? And of course, it's a cognitive disorder, and you have to ask how do the genes converge on a relevant cognitive mechanism? And I think that the synaptic molecules go a long way to that, along with the genetic lifespan calendar. So this is the model that we've uh, put forward based on this work, which is that there's a genetic calendar model of schizophrenia, where the genetic susceptibility of schizophrenia remains silent until young adulthood, when it's exposed by the genetic lifespan calendar. Those regulatory changes that were scheduled to occur in your 20s reorganize gene expression and expose those underlying mutations and their associated phenotypes. And the second is that schizophrenia is caused by mutations that target an age window in the genetic lifespan calendar, and that this window coincides with the peak age of switching synapses and brain genes. Now, this is a very different model to the standard model of schizophrenia, which has been around for several decades, namely that there's a fetal or early insult as a sort of first insult that renders the brain vulnerable to some second environmental insult in young adulthood, a kind of a two-hit environmental model. But the model that we're putting forward is very much a genetic model, where on one hand, there are the genetic variants and susceptibility loci, but that is being played out by this genetic lifespan calendar, which is controlling these other key features of the disorder. Which isn't to say, by the way, that the model that we're putting forward doesn't have some scope for the impact of, say, drugs of abuse or other ex exogenous or environmental effects because the very molecules that are being changed in the genetic lifespan calendar during mid-20s are in fact the sorts of molecules that are involved with responding to the environment and many of which are involved with response to uh, drugs of abuse. So um, the genetic lifespan calendar uh, appears to be controlling these important areas of cognition and we think it's going to be quite important as to how it works uh, in the young adult brain. But the biology of it is something that we have much work to do. And one question that we uh, have already addressed is the question is whether or not it extends beyond the molecular biology of synapses. And we asked the more general question, which was to ask if it controls different types of neurons, excitatory, inhibitory, but does it also interfere or regulate non-neuronal cells, such as glia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia, and endothelial cells? And we used uh, this uh, single cell transcriptome data and this method of analyzing the expression weighted cell type enrichment of the different cell types in the uh, hippocampus of the mouse um, and the prefrontal cortex of the human. And uh, indeed, it turns out that there are uh, highly programmed changes which essentially represent a sequence of cellular and synaptic changes across the human brain lifespan. And this is just a cartoon, and you can go to the primary publication for the graphs. But uh, here is the lifespan, and here is this sort of dotted period here, which is when the peak transcriptome trajectory is occurring in the, in the 20s. And I've already told you about the schizophrenia genes and these postsynaptic proteins here. But now we've broken down the regulatory changes that occur in the different cell types. And in interneurons and pyramidal neurons are regulated at the same time here, perhaps not surprisingly, because they contain many excitatory synapses. Preceding that um, are changes in microglia. And there has been quite a lot of interest in the potential role of microglia in some early aspects of schizophrenia, and it may have something to do with that. But oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and endothelial cells have changes in very particular windows and in the literature, there are some quite well-described cell biological changes that have been documented in the brains of humans and in mice that correspond to those regulatory 
uh, changes. So we think that this genetic lifespan calendar is in no way unique to nerve cells. Um, it is uh, impacting on all sorts of cells here in the nervous system. So here's a few uh, features of the genetic lifespan calendar that we know so far. And it is that it's a new biological timing mechanism that controls gene expression, obviously different to the circadian clock, which is a daily thing. This is a timing mechanism across the whole lifespan. It must be conserved for over at least 100 million years. We find it conserved between mouse and human. And not only are the uh, landmarks conserved, but the sets of genes that are being regulated at different times have homology and parallel. So we believe it's a deep and fundamental aspect of at least vertebrate biology. And independent of the lifespan of the different vertebrates, I mean, it's obvious that in the case of small mammals like mice, it's faster and has a short lifespan um, than in animals such as ourselves, which obviously live much longer and have a slower lifespan. So it can expand and contract depending on the lifespan. And there may be some very interesting relationship between those two things. And females show a delay relative to males. And that young adulthood is enriched in these gene regulatory events, which turn up as those peak events that I've described for you. And that there are these plateaus of gene expression that really mark the onset of those dynamic changes of being a young adulthood and the onset uh, of middle age. And as I've already belabored here, the major impact is on synapse genes that control uh, cognition. And we believe it can explain some of the features, or appears to explain some of the features of schizophrenia. So what is the purpose of a species conserved uh, mechanism of the kind that I've described? And I think the simplest explanation must be that it is there to configure the molecular expression um, of the brain for the relevant age and the behaviors that an animal is required to perform at those different ages. And of course, it's well documented um, in any number of different species, particularly vertebrate species, that behaviors are known to change throughout the lifespan. And these are behaviors that are not just learned behaviors, but instinctive behaviors. There is some underlying biological program that is changing those. And we think that this uh, calendar could program the optimal behavioral response for the given age, and it could control the sensitivity of the animal to exogenous and environmental factors. And bear in mind what I was saying earlier when I was showing you those uh, the graphs about how you change throughout the lifespan, how uh, an animal may be, or think of this as a human, when you're 20, your brain is different to when you're 40 or 60 or 80. And ask yourself, when you are interacting with a person of a different age, that you're reacting to a person with a different genetic makeup that might be influencing the way they respond to you in the outside world. It's quite a fascinating thing to consider. But I just put this slide in because I find this a really very interesting point. You'll notice these diagrams, which are showing these transcription turning point peaks here. And um, I've drawn these red lines because these red lines are really a fascinating point in time, both for the human and for the mouse, because this is what is considered to be the normal lifespan. And if you were to go to the trouble of um, asking how long humans live, the answer is pretty well known, because it can be studied by looking at teeth of deceased humans. And up until only a number of thousands of years ago, essentially all humans lived to about the age of 30. And that was the normal lifespan. And so one, therefore, must consider that something that is evolutionarily conserved, under high constraint, and that um, it would have been there through natural selection. And so it would appear that by the end of one's normal lifespan, or in the last part of the normal lifespan, there have been these rather dramatic regulatory changes, and then one would typically die. But as a result of our modern life, we now live on and for another 50 years. And the same uh, is true in mice. And I suspect that the plateau phase that we are left with is something that is really um, a sort of a figment of our modern world. It's where this behavioral lifespan calendar is now freewheeling. And it is those patterns of gene expression that it is controlling for which natural selection has left us with, but was never intended uh, to be there in the first place. So it's going to be interesting to ask that. So here 
Finally, are some of the sorts of questions that we want to ask about the, the lifespan calendar. How does the mechanism work? I think that's going to be as important and as fundamental as understanding what are the mechanisms of the circadian clock. And we need to answer that question. And what is its relationship to the lifespan? Is there some link between the two? And of course, there's quite a lot of lifespan biology where people have been examining the importance of telomeres and other sorts of mechanisms. Is it also acting in other organs and cells in the body? Or is it somehow unique to the nervous system? I suspect not. I think it will be acting in all sorts of other cells and tissues. And which behaviors and diseases are influenced by the lifespan calendar? And I think there's many, many practical and interesting questions to ask there. And perhaps once we understand more about the mechanisms, we might be able to ask this question here, which is, can it be manipulated to change the apparent age of the animal, its behavior, or the manifestations of mental disorders? And also, what does it mean to reorganize synapse protein expression in young adults? What I mean by that is, as somebody who studies synapse proteins and their, their physical interaction, the assembly of complexes, and how synapse diversity occurs, and the distribution of synapse types across the brain, will we be able to see reorganization of those molecular machines and the distribution in synapse diversity in the young adult brain, which might tell us something uh, very mechanistically important as far as cognition is concerned? So with that, I'd like to uh, finish and again uh, acknowledge the work that I've told you today was done with a PhD student, uh, Nathan, Nathan Skeen, all the transcriptomics and computational biology. And I didn't present the proteomic work uh, done by Marcia uh, on this occasion. But with that, I thank you. Um, questions, Pierre? Down in front? <laughs> it's coming to you. There you go. Very interesting. Um, so under this model of, uh, or you, if I understood your last three slides that are, or you are really thinking that there is senescence and is probably driven by evolution, or you are explaining the difference between men and women, these two years that are longer in human, what is the explanation for this? Yeah, I don't know, it's a simple <laughs> answer. Um, I really just don't know, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite a fascinating aspect uh, because it does not appear to be related to the onset of puberty, which although I don't ever study that subject, I understand that it starts in females prior to males. So there's something else uh, that's going on there, but I really don't know what it is. Uh, it may have something to do with I'm, I'm purely speculating now, but there may be certain aspects of behavior um, in the adolescent female that need to be sort of prolonged a little longer. Perhaps it's something to do with child rearing or something of that kind. But it's certainly a deep piece of uh, biology conserved in these species, so it must be doing something pretty profound. Your data on schizophrenia would suggest that any of the mutations that are linked to the disease genetically should predominantly occur in regulatory regions. Is this true? That's a very interesting point you make. Um, I don't know the answer to that, and that needs to be looked at. One of the things that, is, uh, that has come up, and I know others in this room who've worked on these problems, will know that many of these schizophrenia mutations, or many of the genes that have been implicated in schizophrenia, um, also are associated with autism and intellectual disability, in, a, in other words, a broad set of cognitive disorders. And when I speak to uh, people who actually study the human genetics of those, they, um, they generally say that it is that the early onset, that is to say childhood less than the age of two, autism, intellectual disability, are the more severe penetrant museum, uh, mutations, and that perhaps the more subtle mutations are the ones that escape uh, the phenotype of early age and then turn up in the way that you're suggesting, uh, perhaps through regulatory mutations uh, later on. So um, I think that needs, people need to look more carefully or will be looking more carefully at the types of mutations and relate that to the age of onset. But I think your speculation is probably right. Um. It, it seemed like on uh, one of your later slides you showed astrocytes um, undergoing this genetic switch over right. far out to the right-hand side, yeah. almost to age 60 or 80. 
Could you comment on what functional role that indicates or um, Not really, I have to say. I'm not an expert on astrocytes uh, or particularly on aging astrocytes, so I don't really know. But there are some reports of changes in astrocytes in, at some age that corresponds to that. Um, but I don't really know what those uh, amount to or whether or not those regulatory events are important in that. We have time for one more question. Yeah, you commented on questions I had a little later in your talk, but let me just ask again. If you observe, well, maybe not you, but if mice are observed uh, during their lifespan, do they, does their behavior change at five months of age? Uh, that's, that's part one. And the other is you also commented that presumably these changes are seen in other tissues, but has that been actually looked at? Well, in answer to your latter question, uh, no, it hasn't been looked at. It's something that needs to be the tissue studies that can readily be done. Um, coming back to the former question, which was uh, what has been observed in the age of animals and, and mice at five months, um, there is uh, various, there's various sorts of behavioral literature which we've looked at, which show a sort of a, a young animals younger than that have a higher level of performance in various tasks and then decay. Um, but people haven't looked at it uh, uh, as carefully as perhaps one uh, should do. I should point out here that um, one of the problems of working in mice that we faced with, you know, I've worked on mice since 1985, I've never really known how old they are and what age corresponds to an adult human. We just make it up. We say, oh, it's an eight-week-old mouse, that's a, yeah, that's an adult mouse, or a three-month-old mouse. We haven't got the faintest idea. But what you can do now with these measurements that I've just shown you here is you can align the age of the mouse with that of humans. Now, that could be very valuable with respect to translational studies, whereby, let's say, for example, you're testing a drug that you want to have work on people in their mid-20s, then you should test mice with the relevant uh, behavioral age, or, or indeed, if you wanted to test rats, you could work out the genetic calendar on that. So I think there's going to be a lot of application um, toward understanding and picking the right age for uh, animal studies. Thank you very much. Thank you.